day three of our Reboot Conference. We're very excited to have everyone joining us uh, today. Uh, over the past few days, we've talked about uh, the intersection of uh, tech policy in DC and what's happening in industry. Today, we're focused on tech and the future of news. To find out more about our work at Lincoln Network, you can go to lincolnpolicy.org. Uh, to find out more about the conference and to view videos in the future, you can go to rebootconference.org. Let me start uh, by thanking our sponsors for this uh, event, uh, the Federalist Society Regulatory uh, Transparency Project, uh, AT&T, and, uh, and Facebook, and my incredible team at Lincoln uh, for doing a great job organizing uh, this event. I saved uh, our lead sponsor for last. Uh, we are very honored to have the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation as the lead sponsor for this conference, Reboot 2020, and I am delighted to have Alberto Ibarguen, who is the president and CEO of the Knight Foundation, uh, joining me for uh, this keynote conversation. Just a little bit of background on Alberto. Uh, he served in the Peace Corps early on in his life. He served on numerous corporate boards uh, and, and philanthropic boards uh, later in his life uh, and has had a really remarkable career uh, in between. Uh, and as I mentioned, since 2005, he has served as the president and CEO of the Knight Foundation. So, Alberto, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed the conference so far. I hope I'll be able to say that after this conversation. I, I have no doubt you will, you will deliver. So uh, let's take a trip down memory lane. Uh, I, I want to start the conversation by looking back uh, 20 years. So I, I grew up in Tampa. Uh, I was a sophomore in high school in 2020. And, and I think most people who are listening today can say that they lived through uh, the 2000 election. But, but you really lived through the election. Uh, in addition to all of the other incredible things that you've done in your career, you were at the time the publisher of the largest newspaper in the largest media market in Florida uh, during an election where you had to decide to call the election, not to call the election, and then to cover everything that happened over the month after the American people voted. So let's start by just talking through that experience and anything that you learned that sort of is cycling back in your, in your brain right now as we live through what we're going through right now. Well, look, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I'm happy to go down memory lane. I don't want to get too involved in uh, war stories, but it was a hell of a night. Um, we, had, uh, we had the beginning of what was to be a 30 or a 31 day, I forget exactly, uh, number of days uh, right after Brazil had changed from a centrist to a leftist, major changes in government in a country. Uh, that is the biggest in Latin America, all in one day, and we were taking all that time. The vote was so close in Florida, uh, people forget that it was also made closer by Ralph Nader picking up some 75,000 uh, non-Republican, non-Democratic votes. The third I was in San, yeah, I was in San Jose uh, at a Knight Ritter meeting, which was the, the headquarters, and Marty Barron, who is now editor of the Washington Post, was the editor of the Miami Herald, and he and I spent the better the better part of that night on the telephone trying to decide whether we we would go or not go. Some people were saying it was Bush. Uh, some people were saying nothing. Um, we decided late into the night <clears throat> that uh, we needed to put out a paper, and uh, and so we started to run with a Bush wins headline. And a few, I think it couldn't have been an hour. It was it was a matter of minutes uh, before the Associated Press put out their too close to call and others uh, changed their minds. And so we stopped the press, pulled back the trucks. This is what you had to do back in the Middle Ages. Pulled back the trucks and uh, and uh, re and then rerun uh, a too close to call uh, headline. 
30 or so days later, when the Supreme Court, uh, there, were, there were a number of efforts to try to count the votes, stop the count, go ahead with the count. They were counting the votes and ultimately the Supreme Court of the United States decided enough already, stop, Bush is the winner. That was on a Saturday, as I recall. On Monday morning, we had, because of the Florida open rec open, uh, public records uh, laws, we had a subpoena at every every single uh, registrar's uh, office, every county registrar, because uh, it was all done by counties in Florida. And we had a subpoena for the public record, which was also known as the ballot. The ballot, after the Supreme Court decided, became a public record, and we determined we would do the count. Okay. We the Miami Herald, and we did. And not that it's exactly a bestseller, but it ultimately came out in this book by Marty Merzer called The Miami Herald Report, Democracy Held Hostage. I, I confess it's a bit over the top as a headline. Um, but the headline was that however you counted it and, and even discounting some kinds of ballots and other kinds of ballots, it was our conclusion. We actually hired the firm of BDO Seedman, now called BDO, um, and they, they, after we had been turned down by the big four, because they wanted nothing to do with it. They didn't want to touch it. Wow. They didn't want to touch it. And, uh, and the, the chairman of BDO Seidman said, you know, it would be fun to be a footnote to history. So he took the case. It cost us a bunch of money, but we counted every vote in Florida and determined that George Bush won. Got it. Okay. So let's fast forward 20 years to where we are now. Uh, Pre-COVID, pre-election, it's been a interesting, some would say challenging uh, three to four years for the tech industry and for the news industry. Uh, and, and we're talking about the interplay between the two uh, for, for the, today's conversations. Uh, so provide some framing as we kick off today. Uh, are you optimistic about both industries moving forward? I don't think anyone can answer the question about the industry, uh, certainly not the news industry, um, because I don't think we know yet the shape, what, 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 the, what the business model is that can actually, that is actually sustainable. Um, I don't, what does it mean that today with the vaccine, yesterday's announcement of the vaccine, uh, medical stock went up, uh, airline stock went up, and tech stock plummeted. Mm -hmm. uh, these things are subject to all sorts of vagaries. I think I am optimistic um, about the answer to the basic question. And the basic question is, do we want a democratic republic? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, a democratic republic that's really effective, that really represents the will of the people, is a democratic republic that in Jack Knight's terminology, Jack Knight being the founder of Knight Ritter and, and Knight Foundation, the purpose of great news organizations is to inform so that the people may determine their own true interest. You can't do that if you don't have a system of reliable information. Do we have that in the new tech world yet? No, we don't. Did they do that before? I feel like a broken record because for the last, I'd say 15 years since I read her book called The Press I think it was the printing press as an agent of change. Elizabeth Eisenstein, a professor at the University of Michigan, writes about before Gutenberg, everything was ordered. There was an imprimatur on a, on a document called the Bible, and you knew it was the truth. And the monks would illuminate the manuscript. And it, but it comes the printing press, and any Tom, Dick, or Martin Luther can print whatever the hell they want. And it took them 100 years to figure out how to, ration, how to rationalize these things how to sort them out. It won't take us. It can't take us 100 years. The world moves too fast now. But the example or the lesson is still there to stay at it, nose to the grindstone, to keep trying to figure out what's the best way. Was it perfect when newspapers had a, uh, were at the center of news dissemination? No, it absolutely wasn't perfect. It was a white male point of view. Women were in the in the homemaking pages. Uh, blacks were occasionally, if there was if there was a disturbance, 
blacks or Hispanics would show up, uh, never as an authority on a, on a big issue. So no, it absolutely wasn't perfect. And, and did we get it all right? No, it was a very uh, American-centric uh, point of view. But it was also, interestingly, very balanced because the U.S. newspaper market was so decentralized, was so localized, and local is where the you have the shortest distance between story and reader. And it's not that every reader will go to the Board of Education or the County Hall to check out a particular piece that you might have written today, but there is a greater sense that if somebody writes about in Miami, if somebody writes about Hialeah and, uh, and Homestead as neighborhoods, as if they were the same, you already know this is somebody who flew in from Los Angeles and hasn't and doesn't know the town. Uh, if somebody writes about potholes that aren't fixed, if somebody writes about policies uh, that aren't being implemented, and how do you know? You know because you live there. You know because your kids go to school there, because your neighbors are there. That's that kind of of uh, check and balance. I think might be the beginning of uh, of a return to trust in in reporting and a return to value in um, in in accurate transparent uh, sort of reporting this is hard work that one of the smartest people i have ever had the pleasure and the privilege to meet tim berners lee about two, 13, 14 years, the inventor of the World Wide Web, for Pete's sake. Yeah, you were chairman uh, of the foundation for, for a number of years. I, I was privileged to be chairman of his foundation later on, but when we first met him, uh, he came and, and asked for a grant to uh, he, he, in a part of a night news challenge, and the grant was to, uh, to develop fact, a fact-checking uh, process, and, and uh, when we talked to him, uh, he said, uh, the, I didn't take out a patent, he said, or words to this effect. He didn't take out a patent on the World Wide Web because he felt it should be free and universal. Great, we can all agree. It should be free and universal. But he said the greatest threat to a free and universal web is the lack of authenticity, as he called it, the cheating and lying and dissembling and misinformation and disinformation. And I said, well, what do you want? Money to get 10,000 fact checkers. And he said, no, that would be a newspaper solution. I'm an engineer. I want money to develop code to figure out if I can get code, if I can write programs that will check the veracity of stories. We got as far as checking the sources. We didn't really get, we didn't get to the point of a machine deciding, weighing, making a very human judgment uh, that is really hard to do. Ask all the fact checkers that are trying to do it every day. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very hard to do because your fact checking may be my my view of a bias. So we're, well, still, we're still working on it. Uh, Alberto, I want to double click on the word you used several sentences ago, trust. So yeah. the Knight Foundation has increasingly focused on trust. Uh, both in tech and news, as you were just describing. Uh, real time, pre-election, the polls showed the race going one way, uh, and we all found out election night that the polls were, most of the polls, vast majority of the polls were, were very off. Um, then the election outcome came and, and the vote started to come in, and, uh, and everyone was surprised and is still debating that right now. A poll just came out. Uh, yesterday by Political Morning Consult, and they suggested that 70% of people who voted for Trump are not confident in the election results at, at, at this moment. So my question to you, talking about uh, everything you have been working on uh, over the past few years, what, what are your current thoughts on how do we repair this deficit of trust? Well, this is absolutely not a surprise about a, I don't want to don't hold me to the exact but about a month ago uh, we we came a Gallup came out with a survey that we funded and that was a night Gallup uh, survey that showed something that I I think I I just don't remember seeing before not just a division but that Democrats believed that a great 
that a significant portion of, um, of the other side not only was wrong, but was actively trying to hurt the country. And Republicans in even greater numbers believe that about Democrats. That, so, so, so why should in 30 days, with a really close election that's still being counted, should we think that this was somehow magically going to go away? It isn't going to go away any more than the virus has gone away. Um, this this is a this is a really really hard moment uh, because we are we are more and more entrenched uh, in our uh, in our perspectives um, and and to use um, I think it was Ellie Pariser's uh, Eli Pariser's filter bubble we 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 can find in the web absolutely uh, documented proof for black is white and white is black, for whatever kind of theory you want, uh, you, can, you can have it documented um, uh, uh, consistently and, and plentifully in, on the web. I, I think, I think um, it's time to be modest. I think it's time to be local for us anyhow, for, for the foundation. And that's why we've, we um, about it, and, we, and I've felt this for quite some time, about a year ago, uh, we announced a $300 million initiative to bolster local news, to bolster where you can begin to rebuild trust on the things that we do every day, on the schools, on the, on the, uh, the infrastructure, on the issues around town, the, the sense of humor in a town, the possibilities in a town, the neighbors in a town. I know it isn't um, as uh, fancy and as sexy maybe as, uh, as foreign policy, but I can't, as a regular American, I can't really judge uh, the foreign policy implications. I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not someplace in the middle of a Senate uh, procedural battle. I can barely get, keep my arms around what's happening locally. And so I think, I think there's really good work for us uh, as a foundation, and I think there's really good work for us as as Americans to go back to the roots, to go back to the grassroots, and begin to build a a bond of trust at the local level that hopefully then can grow uh, into a greater kind of of trust um, at uh, at the national level. It is absolutely not helpful uh, to have uh, national leaders who, without uh, without evidence, uh, without uh, anything other than, than frankly, bias, whether it's on the left or on the right. Um, simply say, ah, that city is a Democrat city. Of course they're cheaters. That city is a Republican or that town is a Republican town. Uh, well, of course they're backward. Or, you know, wh whatever your, your cup of tea is, it doesn't help. Uh, what helps, I think, is, is focusing on the, the what used to be called the full accurate contextual search for truth that will give us uh, a basis that will give us the basis on which to agree and disagree as opposed to the bias um, to, with which we begin all conversations these days. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that is a, a great point. You know, this next question is very much tied to that. Um, you know, you mentioned a vaccine was announced uh, that uh, looks very promising and, and it was celebrated. And, you know, the excitement was reflected in the market in, in many of the ways yesterday. Um, you know, we have lived through one of the most polarizing elections in recent history, uh, unprecedented amount of tension. My question is, you know, what do you think the right vaccine to address polarization, to depolarize our country? What does that look like? You know, you, you, you talked about needing to get down to, to more local levels. Uh, can you just sort of unpack what you and the Knight Foundation are doing to try to think about how the media, what role the media and information can play in depolarizing uh, uh, the country? Well, let me say two kinds of things. Number one, I can't think of of a, of a better set of messages than if 
if this vaccine in fact proves out, if this or another vaccine, if uh, both, if, let's assume that uh, there's a President Biden and a Vice President Harris, if, if all four of President Biden, Vice President Harris, former President Trump, and former Vice President um, uh, Pence, all four went and got themselves vaccinated in public. Uh, you ask for a vaccine, that would be a vaccine. That's a, that's a, it's symbolism, it's theater, it's whatever you want to call it. It's also the kind of thing that a lot of Americans would say, hmm. So if these four people who clearly are from a uh, very different part of, uh, points of view, trust this vaccine, this Pfizer vaccine or somebody else's vaccine, um, then maybe I can uh, too. At the local level, people will begin to trust when people they know, when people they're friends with on Facebook, with people they go to school with or people they, they know, that's what they will begin. I think they will be uh, the great ambassadors. And that's not unlike the kind of, of local news um, sort of, uh, of emphasis that we're taking at, uh, at uh, night. It's actually not that different in, in, at, its, at its core from the way the Koch Foundation is talking about grassroots, uh, uh, development of communities from the grassroots, from the grassroots up. In fact, one of the, the we were just publishing uh, uh, a series of essays uh, along with the Kettering Foundation um, that includes a range of points of view that literally uh, range from uh, from uh, blowing everything up. Or, you know, it's sort of a uh, I think it's it's called uh, what's the long game? Is it democracy and civic life. What's the long game for democracy <laughs> and uh, and we have not only a range of views, but we have a range of voices. We have a range of people who are arguing for uh, the best thing you can, philanthropy can do is support the Green New Deal. We've got the head of the Koch Foundation uh, arguing for, for uh, grassroots democratic development. We've got Yuval Levin uh, uh, talking about finding a common purpose. We've got others uh, from from a variety of points of view, and that that actually I'm proud to tell you is the hallmark of Knight Foundation funding. Within that 300 million that I talked to you about, uh, in initiative and local news, which funds uh, the American Journalism Project, standing up online local news news operations around the country, uh, funding Report for America, funding uh, a range of other local news uh, operations. We're also now, we are, we're not quite ready to discuss it yet because we haven't approved it, but we're exploring the possibility of a pretty large investment in, um, in uh, artificial intelligence and local news operations. Uh, will that work? I don't know, but if that's the point of having philanthropy to do that kind of those risk. Uh, risk capital, exactly. And in the scholarship that we funded, fifty million dollars is what we invent. We've invested in the last twelve months or so into straight up scholarship um, that really, it, it, on purpose, is all over the lot in terms of point of view, in terms of of ideology. We've got we've got Yale and Duke and University of Texas, and we've also got. Carnegie Tech, and we've got Stanford, and we've got uh, Howard, and we've got uh, uh, American Enterprise Institute, and we've got the Heritage Foundation, and I just signed off on a grant to the Cato Institute. We are in, we are not interested in saying, here's some money, prove my prejudice. We are absolutely interested in saying, here's some money, do the damn research, get the facts, and then give me your opinion based on the data that you found. That's Dude, a contribution. Research, I like it. So that that's a contribution, I think, uh, to uh, to that should be, I hope, will be a great contribution to policymakers and and thinkers and people who are willing to step back and say, okay, so you mean to tell me you see this and get 
two and two plus seven. Mm, how about this? Two and two plus four and a half. And then let's talk about this. I think I think I'm very, very optimistic about that. I am, by the way, a prisoner of hope. So don't be surprised if I find uh, that despite the evidence, we still can go forward. That's what I believe. Hope springs eternal. Last question, okay. not to end on a depressing note, but I want to drag us back up to national. Uh, I heard you say in a previous interview that your son described you as a lawyer who ran a newspaper. Uh, so put on your lawyer hat. Uh, what happens with Section 230, uh, the debate around speech online? Does anything happen if the Republicans hold the Senate and Biden's in the White House? Just quick thoughts on how do you see that playing out over the next few years? Look, I, I am not in the prognostication business and you can't get me there. Um, I know I know what I'm not good at, and that's one of those things. I can tell you that as a lawyer, as a as a recovering lawyer, uh, I don't find anything wrong with saying uh, let in in all of these various conversations about Section 230. I, I mean, I and I don't know whether we should have uh, the big tech companies uh, blown up or or not. We funded some people who say they should be and on antitrust basis. We should rethink antitrust. We should think about this as a, in a Teddy Roosevelt kind of way. They're just too damn big to be not regulated or for the good of the people or others who say that's the market and that's the efficiencies of the market. Fine, let's have that debate. But also as a lawyer, I am, and as a former newspaper publisher, I am simply not afraid of, of being held accountable. And so why not have uh, Section 230 modified so that if there is provable harm, you have an ability to get compensated? Let the courts, let, if, you, if somebody publishes something, um, then let the speaker and the platform be responsible for the consequences in society. Is that going to change things? Yeah, it will change. It will make things more, perhaps more conservative. Um, it will it will certainly increase the investment by the tech platforms in artificial intelligence agents of the kind Tim Berners-Lee was trying to develop 10 or 12 years ago and is still trying to develop. But is that good for society? I have a feeling it is good for society to be transparent and accountable. And I think that that kind of guide is not a bad thing to have when you're trying to figure out how do we go forward as Americans? Well, Alberto, uh, thank you for the great work that you and your team, Sam Gill, I, I should mention, he and I were uh, at in grad school. Thank you for the great work that you and your team uh, lead at the Knight Foundation. Uh, and uh, we wish you every continued success. Thank you very much, Garrett. Thanks for, for having me here. Absolutely.